Well, good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Free For All Friday edition of the Dan Clement Show, Christian Political Talk Show. I'm your host, Dan Clement, your constitutional warrior, fighting for your right just to be an American. It is October 13th. Happy Friday the 13th, folks, in the year of the Lord 2017. Remember, we're hyphen free, PC free zone, God is still in control, and he does love you. And I'm broadcasting live from the Hemlock Studios here in the beautiful central Susquehanna Valley in the great Keystone State. And it is a little overcast out there again today, a little wet, a little dreary, but you know what? It's fall. We can handle that. We can definitely, definitely handle that. Um, again, if you missed the announcement on yesterday's show, I was a little late in the show uh, talking about this. Um, we, and I mean my wife and myself, uh, or me, myself, and I, and my wife, however you want to put that, have uh, made a managerial decision uh, to leave a blog talk radio platform. Uh, it's a live platform where you can uh, do your podcast live. Um, the reason is, is the cost and the return of that. Uh, my return on investment, I've never gotten a return on my investment with blog talk radio. Uh, no matter how I've tried, uh, and I still believe that it has something to do with the way they are counting things, their analytics, uh, and, and uh, it just, uh, I, I can go back in history and see where I was climbing, 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 and then all of a sudden they said they were coming out with new analytics and the way they, the metrics and the way they measure things, and boom, I didn't have anything. And so I have to believe that, the, uh, that, to me, it's on purpose. Now, whether they think it's on purpose or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, to me, it, their metrics don't match up to everything else that I'm doing, you know, with iTunes and Stitcher. So uh, I am leaving the platform. Uh, I'm, I've already uh, closed down, you know, the, uh, until the end of my payment period. Uh, and uh, I won't be using it after, uh, and it won't be just, it won't be starting Monday, I won't be using it. It'll be whatever day of the week I get a notification from my new um, podcasting site uh, that's going to be storing my podcast that they've, that they've transferred all the podcasts over to their new site or my new site. And then once I get that, then we'll, you know, what I'm just going to put up a notice on, on uh, Blog Talk Radio saying we've moved up our podcasts over here. And if you want to listen to a version of the live show, you can listen on YouTube, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'm still going to use YouTube as my main source, and I will be putting up a, a podcast audio uh, for those folks that like to listen to my uh, uh, broadcast on on their, on their podcast players. And uh, just like yesterday, I had 531 folks, or actually 530 folks, excuse me, download uh, uh either yesterday's episodes or more. And this is the other thing with um, Blog Talk Radio, they don't make it easy to figure out which episodes they're downloading. Like I have a podcast aggregator. It's called G-Potter. And I put URLs in there and I, I download shows and I might download, you know, five, 10 shows, uh, episodes of each shows at one time. Uh, but it, and, and that's all well and good, you know, because I listen to those shows but Blog Talk Radio, I have to go in and do a lot of work to figure out which shows has, has the most downloads. And so the, the new site I'm moving to, the metrics, the uh, analytics are a lot easier. I can shape them however I want as far as telling me the information I need. Plus, this will save me a lot of money uh, to put this uh, over on my website. It'll save you time from searching. You won't have to go from website to website to website. You go right to the show.com you see the show notes, and you'll also be able to go over to the podcast page and listen to the podcast straight from there. Plus, I'm still going to keep the ability on the show notes page to listen to the show from the show notes page. So you're going to get the best of all worlds uh, at one location at show.com So we are going to make this move. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when it's going to be finalized, uh, but I have to get all my... Uh, past podcasts, which is, you know, I'm on uh, 905, uh, plus a couple extras I threw in there for like Saturday and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I have almost a thousand podcasts at Blog Talk Radio. So we're going to get those moved over to the new site. And once that happens, we'll let everybody know. Now, yesterday we ended up talking on the show. Uh, I didn't really get into it a lot. But it's the politics. It was an article by uh, Captain William E. Simpson posted back in July of this year 
uh, politics of monetizing wildfires, a burgeoning government business enterprise, question mark. And I wanted to go through this, and I titled the show today, even though it's Free For All Friday, I titled the show today, and this might be a little provocative, uh, but I think it's accurate. Environmentalism is killing folks. Environmentalism is killing folks. And, and like I said, I'm not going to back off of that. It is true, in my humble opinion, that environmentalism is directly contributing to the death of people, whether it's here in the United States or across the world. In the United States, California, we have these, these horrible, horrible wildfires this morning. Uh, 31 people, have they haven't all been identified, but they found 31 people. That's up from 11 that I reported from the other day. And there's still, out of 900 people that were reported missing, there's still 500, uh, 400 have checked in. There's still 500 uh, that haven't checked in with folks or urged to check in. If you are listening to my program out in California or, or anywhere, and you have friends that live out in California that are in the way of these wildfires, if you can get a hold of them, encourage them, uh, if they had to evacuate, to get a hold of the authorities and say, hey, we're alive and well. That way they don't spend valuable time uh, sifting through rubble, thinking that you might be there because they can't account for your whereabouts. So that's, to me, that's common sense, you know, to let somebody know, especially somebody in authority, uh, that if you vacated, that, that you're alive and well and you're, you know, someplace else. Uh, so they can sort of uh, tick you off the list there. But what contributed to the severity of these wildfires uh, and I have some other, I have over on my uh, desktop over here, uh, just real quick here, the, um, um, the largest wildfires in history. I got this article we're going to go over. Uh, NPR um, is putting out, uh, I found this on NPR, uh, and this is American, the American Experience. It's a program on their show. America's most devastating wildfires uh, dating clear back to 1825 up to, um, let's get down here on the bottom here, uh, up to July 2014 with the Carlton Complex fire uh, in Washington, and there was over 256,000 acres burnt up there. I remember, you know, my brother lives up in Spokane, and I remember the, uh, I remember the folks over there that were kind of suffering uh, from that fire also. So uh, we're going to have that on the show here today, and it's it amazes me how folks can claim to do be doing the environment the best for the environment you know all these environmentalists we only have the environment you know in the best interest at heart but more times than not that best interest trumps and it's not a pun there it trumps the best interests of folks like you and me human beings uh, california they've suffered a drought uh, and it was a self-imposed drought over the years we talked about this Last year on the podcast, uh, we talked about how uh, California isn't allowed to reservoir rainwater and the winter snows and stuff like that that, that flow off the mountains uh, from the winter time into the the you know the, you know from when the spring melt happens and carries these folks through the droughts and everything and get them into the fall uh, because of snail darters and other uh, quote unquote endangered species that could be relocated. People have been saying this for years. It could be relocated. And, but the problem is they're putting the environment ahead of people. The San Joaquin Valley is the breadbasket to the world, is the, the, the kitchen table to the America and the world. They, they grow a lot of crops out there. And without irrigation, because it is kind of arid out there, uh, however, e even though it's arid, they have very long growing seasons and they can grow other things uh, in the winter time, where in other parts of the United States we can't grow, we, we, everything goes hybrid because of the cold and the snow. But they still need water for irrigation to grow these crops. The, the wineries, uh, a same thing. And because it's a self-imposed drought, what are you going to do? They have let they're, they're, they have legislation up there that's protecting these small, insignificant, in my opinion, animals over people. And the same thing with the wildfires, we'll, we'll get into this. You know, the, the, the herbivores that would normally be throughout these regions cleaning up the, the, the brush 
and the grasses and stuff, keeping them in check where they're not overgrown has greatly diminished. And a lot of that has to do with natural predators. We're not talking about mankind. We're talking about natural predators like mountain lions and stuff like that. Uh, have They're not allowed to hunt them anymore. Uh, they're allowed to, you know, they try to relocate them and that. But the uh, um, uh, natural predators, these herbivores, have left, have gone unchecked. And so they're actually decimating the herbivores that would actually take care of a lot of the underbrush. Now, would it eliminate the forest fires altogether? No, it wouldn't do that, but it would lessen the severity of it. The same way with, um, you remember years ago, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday uh, on the show, the uh, Los Alamos fires out there in New Mexico. Uh, those were fueled by a lot of downed and dead timber that was not allowed was not allowed to be harvested. Now, up in Washington State, where my, I got two brothers, uh, two younger brothers uh, that live up there, Tim and Matt, or Tim and Matt, Tim and Joe, Matt's the one that's passed away. Tim and Joe live up there. One, live on, one lives on the east side of Washington State, one lives on the west side of Washington State. Uh, they both have in the past gotten permits to go up into the state forest to clean out deadfalls and down trees. You know, they're not allowed to cut the live ones, but they go through and cut out these deadfalls, which adds fuel to the fire. And as far as I know from my brother Tim, they're still allowed to, they're still allowed to do this up in Washington. They're at least trying to, to lessen the effect of forest fires, although there was a huge one, you know, uh, in 2014 that burnt 256,000 acres up there. That's a lot of acreage to be burnt, and I'm not sure... You know, all the particulars that there's other folks that actually track this. I've been trying to find the information on it. It's very difficult uh, to find this information. However, it has been, an, and then this uh, article by Captain William H. Simpson, we'll see in here where uh, there's emails and that. We'll actually go over this a little bit more today since I have an hour and a half, um, where they he talks about this in this um, uh, article where it's because the environmentalists are suing the forest, uh, U.S. Forest Department over people coming in and trying to clear out some of this dead fall and trying to get fuel out of the system, um, trying to eliminate grasses and stuff because of the, you know, used to be, you know, uh, mountain lions, and we'll get back to California and the herbivores, you know, you're talking about elk, you're talking about deer, mule deer, antelope, stuff like that. It used to be that man kept in check the natural predators because there's nothing on the, in, as far as in the na natural food chain, the only thing above a, a mountain lion or a cougar or something like that is death. That's the only thing in their food chain. They're at the top of the food chain. And if left unchecked, they will decimate and, and almost totally destroy because they, they're doing what they do. They hunt to survive. They hunt to survive. And if you, again, uh, man, mankind can be a balance in nature. We can help conserve things. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing to me the, the absolute idis, idiocy of some folks. You know, we shared on the show here not too long ago, uh, it was University of Michigan, I believe it was, hired a goat herder to go in and clear out the woods that's around their property that had poison ivy and stuff like that. And the unions got mad at them. The unions that actually uh, uh, are the ones that the groundskeepers are part of, they got mad and are suing the university. And yet the groundskeepers wouldn't go back in or clean the stuff out. Not part of my contract, not part of my work, which it was. But they refused because of the personal risk to themselves. So the university did the next best thing. They brought in some goat herders <laughs> and they cleaned out the underbrush. Now, could this be a solution in Northern California? Could be. Could this be a solution in a lot of the uh, state forest and the national forest? Yeah, I think it could be. Would it take care of the whole situation? No. And, and the other problem is, and this is something that uh, I was thinking about last night as I was preparing for the show, there has been a huge controversy, and this doesn't so much have to do with environmentalism, although I think they're behind this. There has been a huge controversy over the years of actually putting out these wildfires. Because before the U.S. Forest Service came along, 
these naturally occurring wildfires are usually sparked up, you know, by dry tinder and, and uh, brush and stuff like that and, and caused by like a lightning storm. Um, even heat lightning would, would start the wildfires. It was a natural mechanism to go through and clean out all the garbage that's in the forest. And if it's, if it's left go, it keeps it cleaned out from time to time. It doesn't build up to, to make a um, uh, conflagration of a fire. It doesn't make a, uh, um, a crucible or cauldron, as it were. So there has been an ongoing debate about uh, this in the National Forest Service. And I think it's also between um, environmentalists wanting to protect the woods. Uh, but on the other hand, letting nature take its course, which you would think the environmentalists would be all for this. Although this article that I'm going to get into about um, is actually the growth of a federal bureaucracy that one has no constitutional authority to exist. The Department of, In of the Interior has no constitutional authority to exist. Okay, let's get that out of the way first. But second, um, even if it did, fighting forest fires costs a lot of money. Now, uh, allowing forest fires to burn, to take, do the natural thing that, that they've done for thousands of years, since the earth's been created, you know, it's a natural thing. Matter of fact, um, the, the American Indians, especially out on the plains, uh, they would do controlled burns there so, the, so the, the, the plains wouldn't get too overgrown with brush and grass and stuff and, and to keep them down to a manageable level. Some of them would, not all of them. Uh, and this, I remember, remember this in history class. But the, the, the idea that we have a movement out there of environmentalists that put nature and the things in nature above man is just incredible to me you know how these how these folks can put nature above man especially when we're we're part of the ecosystem we're not an aberration you know we're not a mis we're not an evolutionary mistake you know matter of fact we're not even evolutionary god did not create us by happenstance or mistake it just didn't happen that way we are a part of god's creation and if we can help God's creation along, so be it. And again, these putting out forest fires before they run their course, as like I said, has been a huge debate. And I kind of side with, I kind of side with, uh, you know, get the people out of harm's way, let the forest fires run their course, and the forest is healthier afterwards. Um. Trees replant themselves, the pine cones, did you know pine cones, if, if a forest fire doesn't come through, it doesn't crack them open and spread the seeds, makes it harder, you know, for the trees, for the, for the forest to reforce themselves with younger trees. I mean, that's a fact, you know, get people out of harm's way and let the fire do its job, which the fire does have its job to do. If we're not going to let people go into the national state forest and clear out some of the uh, deadfalls and stuff to use as firewood for their homes. If we're going to not control predator populations and allow herbivores, natural herbivores, to go in and keep the brush down, you know, then we have to we have to rely on on a, I guess you'd call it an artificial way. You know, maybe like I said, maybe you know, give permits to goat and sheep herders to go in there and. And keep the grasslands trimmed and, and the forest, the goats would do a tremendous job on forest. What other animals won't eat is like candy to goats. <laughs> it really is. Uh, so we're going to talk about that today. Uh, I do have some things on Puerto Rico. Matter of fact, I have an email I want to get to uh, from uh, Preacher in the Church of Christ in San Juan. Because I was looking up, uh, trying to look up information, news information uh, about what's happening with the hurricane you know, recovery down in Puerto Rico. And every news outlet that I've been trying to find, with the exception of a few, have been so slanted in their bias against Trump. They're blaming everything on Trump, you know, that's happening down there in hurricane recovery. And this, what's been happening in Puerto Rico has been going on for years, folks. 
It was going on under Obama. It was going on under Bush. It was going on under Clinton. It was going on under the first Bush. It was going on under uh, uh, President Reagan. Um, pretty much the government in Puerto Rico has been driving that country into the ground for I don't know how many years. Infrastructure has been suffering for years. Hurricane, hurricanes actually expose those deficiencies. And it just, it, it just appalls me how many people here in the United States and in Puerto Rico are blaming President Trump and not laying the blame on their, you know, uh, the mayors and the, uh, the governors down there, especially the governor of Puerto Rico, uh, for the, the, the bad state of affairs that happen, happen to be in Puerto Rico. And, and the problem is the, the, the government has the economy so choked because it, the, the government is top heavy above regular employment and the taxes, you know, all the tax money goes to pay for everything in government and nothing for infrastructure or anything like that. It just amazes me Puerto Rico hasn't fallen off the map earlier than this. And so I got this report, I got this email, and hopefully he's going to get back. I, he got, he's gotten back to me. I said, well, he said, the Internet's kind of slowed down there. Things are slowly recovering. And uh, uh, they, I guess they had some water damage to the church, and they can't do anything about it. They can't clean it up until they get water. They don't have running water there yet. And so, you know, like I said, there's a lot of infrastructure problems down there, but it's not President Trump's fault. It really isn't. And being in a Caribbean island uh, that can be and has in the past and will in the future be hit by hurricanes, you think you think they would go through and restructure things a little bit better than what they have in the past. Get rid of above ground electric electricity. Just get rid of it and, and, and bury it. Now, maybe, maybe they can't bury all of it because of lowlands and flooding and stuff like that. I don't know the answer to it. But there's got to be something better. Even if they don't bury it, there's got to be something better than, than hoisting these lines up on telephone poles and, and watching them break over in these high winds and hurricanes. Then you got to wait to clean everything up off the streets before you can get in and assess everything and get electricity started to turn back on because you got to rebuild the whole system. It's got to be a better way. There's, <laughs> I'm telling you, there has to be a better way. If we can put, you know, if we can send... Um, uh, spacecraft out past Pluto, you know, the big gas giants and stuff like that. If we can put little rovers on Mars and we send men to the moon, we can definitely figure out an infrastructure problem that, that is on Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. You know, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Got some things about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Iowa's new voter ID law uh, uh, would have disenfranchised my grandmother by Ari uh, Berman over at The Nation. Uh, and again, folks, it's, it amazes me how these people lie, how these progressives, these anti-freedom folks out there lie uh, to the American public and their followers. And their followers will believe this. Their followers will eat this up. Uh, and, and much, much more uh, I have going on here. So uh, let's, get into the, let's get into the show here real quick. Are you the handy person of the house? I know the weekend's already upon us, but maybe you're going to start working on something over the weekend to try to get it fixed. Either it's appliance or piece of power equipment you have, and you and you tear into it. And you figure out what your parts you need on it, uh, but you're not sure you're not sure where to go to get them. Go to thedanclemmashow.com and click on the Sears Part Direct widget. You by doing that you help support the show. But the better the best thing about it is you'll be able to find the parts you need to fix the equipment that you're or the appliances you're looking to fix and if you go to the danclemmashow.com you'll see an offer code over there that you can type in and get 10 percent off all your lawn equipment and more and I'm, I'm telling you right now every time i've been over there and saved 10 percent myself it has covered the cost of shipping it has covered the cost of shipping so what are you waiting for uh, go to the show.com and go to the Sears Park Direct widget and find the parts you need to fix everything you need to fix as far as appliances and uh, power equipment. Today's daily Bible reading comes from uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to the governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, 
that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Now, I've heard people read this verse here and say, we just got to follow everything the government tells you to do. Well, if that's the case, then, then God's word is a lie and it contradicts itself. He says, so, therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man. Now, what has been, and, and folks, let me, let me preface this by saying, abortion, abortion is not legal in America. Now, you say, well, Roe v. Wade says it is. No, that was a, a court ruling. And I hate using that word ruling, but that was a, a court ruling that was, that was put down. We do not have legislation on the books on the federal level, and it should be on the federal level anyway. We don't have legislation on the books that says that abortion is legal. And even if it was legal, it doesn't mean we need to participate in it. It's not one of those laws. And this is, this is where you get into this, uh, you, you got to just be discerning of everything. Abortion is a law that forces you to have an abortion. It just allows people to have abortions. You see the difference there? So we have to submit to the ordinances of men. As long as they don't contradict God's laws, we have to submit to the ordinance of men. That way they don't have a leg to stand on when they, when they start accusing us of being evildoers when we're not in fact and in truth and can't be proven. So that's what Peter's trying to get at here. And in verse 16, uh, we need to be free, yet not using our liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. We have liberty in Christ and God, but we can't use that as a cloak for vice, which there are a lot of quote unquote Christians out there that do use their liberty as a cloak for vice. I mean, I can't, you know, one of them that comes to mind, it just still boggles my mind that uh, Joel Olstein, I mean, he's got, he's got private jets. He lives in a mansion, you know, a multi-million dollar mansion. And, uh, you know, he tries to justify everything, you know, there, the spending of the people's money that he's actually uh, hoodwinking out of. And there he's using his liberty in Christ, quote unquote, liberty in Christ for him uh, as a cloak for vice. I'm just telling you, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know any Church of Christ preacher that has a multi-million dollar mansion. I don't know a Church of Christ preacher uh, that has private jets that they fly around on. If uh, folks in Church of Christ go on missions uh, trips, they usually take a uh, coach. At the most, they take business class. But most of the time, it's coach to save money because they're not spending their money. They're spending other people's money. I'm just... I, putting out the facts here folks uh today's quote meal comes from mark olson a-u-l-s-o-n sin has a diminishing factor to it it always gives its best in the beginning it never gets better after that it only gets worse amen and wayne jackson of the christian courier has an article out here what is faith in christ good question to ask Good question to get answered, and he, it's, a, it's a rather lengthy article, but he does a good job explaining what is faith in Christ. And that's very important for us as human beings to answer, especially for Christians. Those that are in Christ through baptism, we need to understand what faith in Christ is. We need to be able to understand that so we can explain this to other folks. Okay. Uh, let me get this. Uh, I want to get this open over in a... Uh, uh, over on my desktop over here so you can actually see this um now it's being slow it wants to be slow okay okay this i, I did show you this yesterday and i just want to show you I'll, I'll show it to you again today um politics and monetizing wildfires as a burgeoning Government business, question mark, or a, not as a, but a burgeoning government business enterprise. This is by Captain William E. Simpson. I uh, said so this was back in July of this year, 2017. He says, fellow citizens, taxpayers, big shots and celebrities, politicians and bureaucrats. Sorry, you get the third billing because you work for the taxpayers. <laughs> Somehow over the past century, the notion that, 
that the notion of what it is to be a civil servant and having a great privilege of serving the we the people has morphed into the current notion of being elected as a demigod and being above the people we see it all around us today in politics so that statement is self-evident i think we're getting snowed by many officials and politicians and it is to the point now where we don't even seem to care if we even know or believe that it's really time for a change and we can't afford to sit on our hands and hope president trump will do it all even if he is inclined he needs all americans to start acting like we care for our beloved america and all that it encompasses as well as our uh, as our own hard-earned money which pays for what has become the greatest show on earth Few people are aware that the United States Forest Service is now spending a half, 50% of their total budget on fighting wildfires and doing so when there is really a readily available, simple, cost-effective, virtually free method of abating the dry grasses and brushes that fuel these explosively hot and disastrous wildfires. As I write this, catastrophic wildfires are devastating many western states now this again it was in july so this was actually before the california wildfires uh, the dead and dying trees are no doubt fuel for wildfires in our forests but as any cub scout will tell you you can't ignite a dry log with a match uh, dry hot summer weather or not it takes a lot of kindling to accomplish that feat so when we think of previous burns as well as any as dry forests the fact that grasses and brush reappear annually and once dried by summer heat provide the kindling. Abating grasses and brush is a key initiative to uh, mitigating wildfire risk. The math is very important because even marginal mitigation of wildfires can cost that cost many billions annually would likely represent hundreds of millions of dollars in real savings for the American taxpayers. Everywhere in the world where a species of large herbivore has its population depleted or eliminated, vegetative, fuel for fires, materials, grasses and brush become excessive, resulting in a scenario where catastrophic wildfires take over on an annual basis. The science is crystal clear and incontrovertible at this point. According to the Science Magazine, by altering the quality and distribution of fuel supplies, large herbivores can shape the frequency, intensity, and spatial distribution of fires across the landscape. There are even unique interactions among large, large herbivore populations that can influence fire regimes. For example, facilitative interactions between white rhinos and uh, mesoherbivores result in reduced fuel loads and fuel continuity and constantly uh, few, uh, consequently fewer large intense fires. Other factors can influence the frequency and intensity of fires, particularly in locations where the total area burned is strongly related to the un, uh, undulated population side. For example, the Serengeti wildebeest um, populations interrupt, interrupted after the, um, the Rinderpest virus was eradicated in the 1960s and the subsequent increase in grazing pressure led to a widespread reduction in, in the extent of fires and delayed recovery of tree populations. The removal of plant biomass by browsing also reduces uh, fire fuel loads and increases fire uh, susceptibility. Thus, there is, a, there is scant evidence of fire in much of Australia until the uh, megafauna disappeared after human arrival. And it's no coincidence that here in the western United States, where wildfires are turning forest into ash year after year, we have depleted herbivore populations, and in other locations, deer, elk, and are virtually non-existent. As one of the many examples I could easily make, in the state of California, the deer population has plummeted from about 2 million animals to under 400,000 deer in the entire state. And this too is the ultimate result of defective management of large predators by California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now, let me stop the reading here. This is part and parcel to what environmentalists, oh, it's just a shame that we have to kill these predators out there. But yet when you decimate the deer population in California from 2 million deer to just a little over 400,000 because you're not managing the predators, then you got a problem. You got a real problem. And, and, and one of the biggest problems is, 
And this is, I don't see it as a real problem, but it's just a fact of life that as human beings build more places, we take up more of the natural habitat of the deer population, the elk population, stuff like that. And so they get squeezed into a smaller area and it makes it easier for the mountain lions and the cougar stuff like that to actually prey on them. All right. You would think people who call themselves managers would know about and understand the foregoing science and the reports given that large amount of peer reviewed studies have been published. Sorry, that's not the case. The forest wildlife managers, including many people at the BLM, are instead focused on two things in this order, money and power, both of which are extracted from the American people or people of America. But as most people know, these managers answer to their masters, the politicians and bureaucrats who bear most of the blame for these wildfires. Money as in enriching their budgets and protecting their new wildfire ex expert enterprise, excuse me, that, that creates more state and federal jobs at taxpayer expenses of both cash and forced resources and diminish, uh, diminishment of critical watersheds. It is dishonest and immoral to adopt a forced management plan which con concurrently rejects sound wildlife abatement concepts such as ground fuel reduction v via herbivore reintroduction. While currently allowing forest and property to be devastated annually simply to create more government-based jobs that are to be paid by already overburdened taxpayers, managing an annual disaster with a focus on a revenue model is what I would call malfeasance. And given the obvious neglect of prioritizing preemptive solution-based focus as opposed to a reactionary response model, the use of the term malfeasance may not be uh, or may not be unfair and it certainly might be called incompetence and power is the ability to rule citizens using political deceptions lies and methods of deflecting blame and dis discarding citizen input out of hand regarding any solutions forwarded by the people outside the political and bureaucratic circles they want to retain all power within their circles of influence and that's what we see here in america folks really do this is not how our founding fathers intended our constitutional republic system of government to function it's currently a sham having spent many decades in and around the mountains of nor northern california and southern oregon growing up on the family's uh, working ranch i've had a great opportunity to study firsthand the recurring wildfires and the uh, uh, socioeconomic and environmental impacts of catastrophic, catastrophic, excuse me, wildfires, along with the devastating effects of the closure of the logging industry. Recently, a dra I drafted an article which uh, posited a wildlife fuel abatement mythology using large herbivores. Unlike any any other options, this offers tremendous economic and environmental advantages as further outline herein. Many of America's remote forest areas are not suitable for livestock grazing, even though there is an abundance of grasses and brush. The terrain is far too difficult for livestock management, which also makes fighting wildfires in these areas far more difficult and costly to fight, and firefighters die while many others are injured. The article entire Fire Brigade, the value uh, proposition of wild horses, has was sent to my local county supervisor as well as the representatives of my, con of my congressman, uh, Mr. Doug LaMoffa, California District uh, 01. Sadly and frustratingly, <clears throat> I had the firsthand experience of being brushed off by the representative of my, uh, of my own congressman, Doug LaMoffa. I wonder if he knows how his constituents are treated. It's funny how they only want to hear from citizens when they want even more of our money or need to get reelected. Re of course, I think those days are coming to a quick end. In an email here and below from Aaron Ryan, the representative of my congressman, Doug LaMafia, or LaMalfa, regarding my fire brigade proposal, I was told no in certain terms that none of this is news in regard to my novel idea of abating wildfire fuels using large her herbivores. Her observation was manifestly incorrect. I had sent my article in its entirety to Ms. Ryan along with an introduction, some wildlife cost metrics, and photos, photos of examples of trees that have obviously benefited from the, the effect of symbiotic uh, mutualism with large herbivores in the case wild horses. 
So when I received the response below from Mrs. Ryan, I was of course astounded that it seemed clearly designed to discourage and defer my initiative by incorrectly alleging that I had proposed uh, was nothing new and incorrectly inferring that it somehow involved tree cutting, which would attract uh, litigation also incorrect since there was no tree cut cutting involved. The trend in the Gravit mythology of sidelining citizens has been in widespread use by bureaucrats and politicians far too long and it has inflamed citizens to elect Donald J. Trump as our pre president. Another tactic is making themselves completely unreachable except through so-called gatekeepers who seem to meter access according to the size of your wallet. And now we see career politicians and bureaucrats seem to be revolting against our elected president as they fear the voice of the people may be carried out to some extent or another by President Trump. Time will tell, but this paradigm of government for and by the government must be brought under control. It seems like smart politicians would want to listen to citizens who pay the bills and who might have something valuable to contribute to, to very serious subjects that cost taxpayers billions of dollars annually, but alas, that doesn't seem to be the case. Now, let me stop the reading here before I go on to this email. We pay congressmen, House of Representatives, senators, and the president, we pay them a salary out of tax dollars. And this was years ago. I haven't updated this. I don't know. I can't remember. This was probably around 2010, 2011. Um, the average annual income for a Congress person is just under $700,000 a year. Now, we only give them like one hundred and thirty or $140,000 a year in salary uh, for a House of Representatives. Okay. Uh, and that's talking about the salaries of representatives. Close to $700,000 they take in every year average. Some more, some left, less. It's not all come from the taxpayers. They're getting speaking fees and other, other ways that, that lobbyists and corporations can give them money legally uh, that enlarge their purses. Now, the Senate's even worse. The Senate's average annual income is like $1.7 million. And that's not, and folks, th this study, this wasn't even taken into account any personal businesses that they still owned or were put in receivership, whatever, that they're still gaining money from. $1.7 million. So it's not all come from the taxpayers. So if it isn't all come from the taxpayers, how can the taxpayers be expected to control these folks? Simple math, right? Simple math. All right, here is that incredibly disappointing reply. Original message from Ryan, uh, or Aaron Marie Ryan. Uh, to Captain William H. Simpson, uh, Tuesday, uh, June 27, 2017, removing fuel load reduces risk of wildfire. Environmental lawsuits using the Equal Asset Access to Justice Act are largely to blame. They sue every single management plan that involves tree cutting, even in its burned areas. None of this is news, and it's not within the control of the Board of Supervisors, as I'm sure you're aware. I could go on and on, but have a meeting um, you get my drift, Aaron Ryan. In God we trust, all others we question. Uh, as to her cute little byline, I say, in God we trust, politicians must take a polygraph. <laughs> I like that. Again, to be crystal clear, Miss Ryan was provided an entire article and information intro, none of which mentioned tree cutting. Fires are devouring our forests, destroying habitats, killing thousands of animals, obliterating watersheds nation nationally as I write this. It's in the nation's uh, news as I write this. Watching all the wildfires around the U.S. burning forests and homes this early in the season suggests that the losses may be monumental this year, 20 to $50 billion in a now reoccurring annual nightmare. Just in and around our county, uh, Sesescu, here in California, cost, cost and losses have been in the billions of dollars. And, and folks, that's, that was back in June. They're, they're fighting these fires again. So as we learn from the response of the Congress, congressman's aid, ideas are quickly shot down without even bothering to actually read them. And this further exemplifies the myopic and defective reasoning, stuck thinking in a small box, where they have clearly and undeniably misconnecting the idea of returning a native species back into their habitats to clean up the fuel grasses and brush off the forest floors. 
In the case of Sasaskia County, California, fifth largest county in California, by relocating the horses from the local BLM corrals over in uh, Modoc County into more remote into the more remote county, state and federal forest areas where there are no commercial grazing herds, creating a competitive issue. The horses would naturally abate the excessive ground fuel, loading up, uh, loading a rate of 30 pounds of dry grass and brush per horse per day. And it seems reasonable that the BLM would give other government organizations a sweetheart deal on horses to save their storage costs for the horses. Just 10,000 horses can abate 300,000 pounds of dry grass and brush in a day. In just one month, over 4,500 tons of grasses and and brush abated. This amount of abate, abatement is very significant. 40,000 horses uh, can abate 1.2 million pounds of dry grasses and brush daily. Okay, here's the guide to help with the general understanding of the weight of the dry fuel and ground of the burn, burn rate. Okay, now he goes on, he doesn't have a whole lot to do, and he, he goes on and talks more and more about the math that's involved here. And again, I just want to show you these real quick. You have this from NPR over at the uh, the American Experience on NPR, uh, where they're um, talking about the, the wildfires in U.S. history uh, from 1825 on. And they stopped, and uh, the last one they had reported on was like 2014. Uh, this is an article over at Ranker.com, largest wildfires in U.S. history, wiping out millions of acres of land and killing hundreds. The worst wildfires in U.S. history are some of the worst natural disasters to ever hit the country. Though not all were caused by natural means, with some set by arsonists and created by abandoned campfires, each devastated large area of land wiped out buildings caused fatal and caused fatalities. What are the most major what are the most major wildfires and major forest fires in U.S. history in America? Read on and find out more. Though modern through modern though modern times have seen large fires, especially in California and Texas in the past few years, the worst fires ever in the United States took place over 100 years ago. The deadliest, the 1871 uh, Pichitago fire, claimed 2,500 lives, while the largest was the Great Fire of 1910, burning three million acres of land. As shown in these famous wildfires, many of it. Many, if not all, incidents of tragedy, wildfires are very dangerous and can claim lives just like the worst tornadoes ever. Fortunately, we have the old, uh, as the old slogan states, forest fires can be prevented. What are the worst fires in history? Uh, take a look at, at the list of wildfires you find out for yourself. And it goes on, it talks about the Gatlinburg fire, uh, the firestorm of 2016, where 14 people died uh, and there was 80... Um, Let's see here. Does it say the acreage? Seventeen hundred acreage were scored, uh, scorched, and one hundred seventy structures destroyed. About fourteen thousand people were evacuated. Uh, one hundred thirty injured and twenty five hundred without fire. Um, you know, and that's just that was just the latest one last year, not including uh, the fires of this year so far. So. I just wanted to go over that and share that with you because this is important, folks. This is important to understand that a lot of this, even though it's, it naturally occurs through through thunderstorms and stuff like that, uh, there are people out there trying to come up with cost-effective ways to lessen the severity of these forest fires. Through natural, out in California, through these horses. I didn't realize horses ate that much a day. But I guess they do. The wild horses, I guess that's all they can uh, eat is brush and, uh, and grasses. But that would go a long way of, of actually, actually tackling a problem. But yet, and I know this for a fact, and you can go and research this, the Bureau of Land Management pays uh, hundreds, if not millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to house these wild horses. Instead of allowing these wild horses to go free in the, into the wilderness. Now, I understand uh, me and my wife watch this uh, show on TV. Uh, it's called Heartlands, Canadian uh, series uh, about this horse ranch. And there some of the episodes uh, show these wild horses that are free up in Alberta, Canada. And a lot of the ranchers try to shoot them because they're taking grass off of their pastures. And they don't understand if they just relocate them up into the mountain areas further, uh, that there's plenty of grass and brush up in those areas that would actually take care of them. But, but for some reason, they'd rather shoot them. And I'm a horse lover, and I don't want to see any horse, even a wild horse, be shot if there's another alternative that can be taken. Um, 
so it just it, it, it amazes me the bureaucracy that we have set up wants the status quo because the more forest fires are out there the more money they're going to get to fight these forest fires and the problem is they're they're allowing the environmentalists to dictate to them what they're going to do. Matter of fact, this this uh, lady that was in that letter I showed you there, um, he didn't say anything about cutting trees, but yet she assumed that they were going to talk about cutting trees. And there's nothing wrong with cutting trees. If they're dead, if they're standing dead trees and stuff like that, I got a whole load years ago when I was still driving truck. I got, it was like a load and a half almost of uh, all oak trees that were dead and they weren't totally bug written but they had enough damp bug damage in them they they were no no good to mill uh but the, the the guy that owned the land didn't want them standing anymore so i actually got them i, I paid the uh the cutter i paid him i think it was like 250 a load or something like that he wanted way more for him you know like, well you know firewood loads worth this much it's like look i'm doing all the hauling and I said, yeah, you're bringing them out of the woods. But I said, I'm paying you. It was almost twice uh, what he normally got for a load of wood going to a load of saw logs going to the, the timber mill. So I got like a load and a half of these. They were dry. They were they were um, seasoned oak. And it, I wore out of my chainsaw blades real quick because it was dry and abrasive. But I had a good heating season that year with all that oak uh, that I had. But anyway. It just amazes me how these environmentalists have these bureaucrats so kowtowed that they won't even listen to reason. They won't even listen to reason in facts. <laughs> and it just that just amazes me. It doesn't boggle my mind because I've run up against so many bureaucrats out there uh, that uh, they may be educated in whatever that field is that they're a bureaucrat of. And that's, uh, that's sketchy. In my opinion, that's a pretty sketchy thing. Uh, However, uh, they're not gods. In this article, they called them demigods. Uh, they're not demigods. They don't know everything. And the smartest people I've ever known are people that know what they don't know. <laughs> and I've run into too many bureaucrats that don't have that attitude. And that's just, those are plain, simple facts, though. They really are. Okay, I have this Puerto Rico. We're talking about Puerto Rico. Let me read the email I got. Uh, this is from Brother Jim uh, Galetti. Uh, he's the preacher down there in uh, Puerto Rico. And I asked him, I said, I said I'm trying to find news. I, I told him I'd do a show here on the Dan Clement Show. It was the name of the show. And I told him, I said, I'd love to interview him after things get back to normal. Because he said in this email that his um, uh, internet connection is real slow. And that's, everything's down down there. He said, hey, he said, hey, Dan, thanks for the note. We are hanging in there. Conditions are slowly improving. Uh, most do not have power. A few have water. Some stores have opened and the lines are going down. Our new church building was flooded and we can't do anything until the water comes back on. Uh, some of our members uh, lost everything they own. But thanks to the generosity of many members and congregations in the states, we'll get them back, uh, back set up. Uh, I would write more, but the internet is very slow. Uh, you can see pictures on my Facebook page. God bless Jim. And so I said, you know, I, I, and that, I just sent him the email this morning because I was frustrated last night trying to find some unbiased news. I thought, you know what, let me go to a brother in Christ. And I, I know I know that he's going to be an honest and straight shooter with me. And, you know, just let me know. And he's, he's telling us, he said, if you have waters, he said, some stores have reopened and lines are going down. Um, I've seen videos on the Internet where. Uh, Crowley trailers are being hauled by trucks and, and some of these guys my wife said would you do that and I said absolutely this truck was going by on a man-made they dug out the side of this hill where this the landslide took out the road and they dug out this side of the hill that was still pretty stable and it was a one-lane road and it was pretty it was pretty rough and this guy was taking this uh, Crowley trailer to the inner part of uh, Puerto Rico to get him to stores so we have this this gentleman here that's talking about you know they they are getting you know some stuff to stores in, in that and uh, they're actually um, I think they're doing a bang up job down there I really do and so I haven't heard anything back from him like I said the internet slowed down there I'll let you know Monday 
uh, if I hear anything more from him. But I asked him if he, you know, when things get normalized, if he would come on the show and talk a little bit about what's happening down in Puerto Rico. I mean, he lives down there, or he's a preacher down there at Church of Christ. So I have that. I have that. Now, I had this um, video. Chris Cuomo of CNN grills uh, GOP representative over Trump tweets on Puerto Rico. Uh, they're star there are people starving. And again, let me remind you before I show you this clip that th the problems down in Puerto Rico existed before hurricane the hurricane season happened this year. They, they, they have an infrastructure problems. They have an unemployment problem down there. They have a government problem. They have a bureaucracy problem down there. They have an economy problem down in Puerto Rico. These existed before the hurricane season of this year, and the hurricanes that came through, especially Maria, only exasperated them, made them worse, in other words. So is it President Trump's fault that these issues were going on well before he was president of the United States, and can they be blamed on President Trump? And again, if you're new to the show, I'm not a Trump supporter. I'm a member of the Constitution Party, and I voted for Daryl Castle in the last election. I've had people say, well, you're just, you're doing that so you can virtue signal. No, I've been a member of the Constitution Party since 2008. And I made one mistake in that whole time, and I regret this to this day, that in the 2012 elections, that I voted for Mitt Romney. Instead of standing in my principles and voting for the, the uh, Constitution Party candidate, and I felt horrible afterwards uh, that I did that, and I, I vow never to do that again, <laughs> and I haven't so far. Uh, and so I don't, I didn't do that for political cover. You know, like I said, I was a member of the Constitution Party since 2008, uh, 2007. My um, awakening in politics. Uh, happened with uh, uh, Senator John McCain and Senator Lindsey Graham uh, wanting to give amnesty to everybody. This was back in 2000, the summer of 2007. You go back and read, uh, read up on this. I was driving trucks still then, and I was just so fed up with the, with the Republican Party about amnesty and, and, and lackluster immigration controls and stuff. Uh, and when I tried to get hold of what broke the straw of the camel's back is I got a hold of the state GOP. Uh, and uh, by email, and I was trying to look for those emails, and, and I can't find them, but I, I did email them, and it's, uh, they're probably in one of my archives, I just didn't go back far enough. I was pretty much, and this is just paraphrasing, to, to sit down and be quiet, because they knew what they were doing, because the, the Pennsylvania GOP were in support of McCain and Graham, with this amnesty without securing our borders. And w when that happened, I, I I'm, you know, I was just, I was frustrated. I started my podcast that fall or that winter because of that. And I did a lot of research. I said, I got to find a new political party to be part of. And I, and I looked for the alternative or third parties out there, the alternative political parties, I call them. And I started reading through them and I found the constitution party. I thought, well, you know what? I read this document called the constitution and I, you know, let me see what they got to say. And, and Boy, how do they fit in with, with what I believed in? Constitutional conservatism, uh, a faith and belief, belief in God, just like uh, uh, most of the founders. Oh, I found my home, and I've been a member ever since. So, let me play this. You know, Cuomo, uh, and, and honestly, folks, I... <laughs> I wouldn't believe CNN if it was the middle of the day and the sun was shining and the skies were blue... If they told me exactly what I just said, that the sky was shining and the sky, or the, the, the sun was shining and the skies were blue, I wouldn't believe them. If CNN reported that, I would not believe them. That's how bad I believe CNN and their reporting. And Chris Cuomo is the king of fake news and the king of fake controversies trying to drum up this animosity against President Trump. Now, here is the, um, uh, the, short, the short video real quick here. When you have less than half the people with power and water, where do you see success? Nobody's saying the first responders aren't working so hard. We see it every day. 
But the success is incremental just, every single day. But, but you folks enough. on CNN, what is enough? What is enough? Having the power on the next Having day? Having them not the, starving in the hills of Puerto Rico, not sir. Starving not starving in the hills, Not existing on a box they're lunch not starving. and a six-pack of water. You would you would wrong. you have talk you would, to would the you men and women who are on the ground go in there and set up the, mess tents and 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 you feed should do everybody. whatever you can. They are doing whatever they can. There is a limit to everybody's ability, including the United States government. There is a limit to those things, and they are doing absolutely everything they can and more. What Please. does a success look like to you? Does that? What does it look? Like? Crisis. Does every single person have to have power crisis, the next day. Crisis abated. The people who need food and water having it, not 100% restored back to power. We get that this is so, a challenge. So if the water gets there five minutes late, is it's not that about a five minutes late. In, the, in places well, outside San Juan, quantify, they're not quantify, even close to that. Quantify, you know, quantify look, your claim. Here's Mr. my Cuomo. concern. Can you quantify look, any of it? Look at, look at you my You can't just make these claims and not put any metrics to it. <laughs> who is without for how long? Who? How many people? Who are they? You have less than half the country that has what Without you need power. to sustain life. Without Fresh power. water, power, food, places to live. Mr. Cuomo, you're simply just making this stuff up. You, how am up. I making it up? What less am I making up? Country, if half the country didn't have food or water, those people would be dying. And they're not. Now, Chris Cuomo, and this, and this is the lamestream media in general does this. They say things without backing anything up. I, like I said, I just had this email today, and this CNN thing popped up yesterday. This was on TV yesterday. And yes, they're without running water, but he said, he said you know, they have food and water. You know, let me bring that back up again. I just want i just want to make sure I'm not misquoting things here. He said, Dan, thanks for the note. We are hanging in there. Conditions are slowly improving. Most do not have power. A few have water. We're talking about running water. We're not talking about water for drinking and stuff like that, because I know better. I've seen, <laughs> seen all these videos with FEMA putting these out. Matter of fact, I didn't get a chance to research it because I just saw it this morning. Um, One American News Network is actually reporting that the FBI is down there investigating uh, government officials, bureaucrats, that are not giving the FEMA supplies to the people it was intended to go to. They're actually giving it to uh, campaign contributors and, uh, you know, their crony friends before they're giving it to the people that really, really need it. And so the FBI is actually down there investigating this, according to One American News, on the news this morning. And yet, Chris Cuomo cannot give you, he just keeps hammering that. 50% of the people don't have water or food. And that's not the case. I mean, the U.S. military has been down there uh, handing stuff out. They've been trying to help get the infrastructures open. They've been getting diesel fuel to the hospital so they can have power, so they can take care of their patients. Um, other generation sites are getting diesel fuel too. They're helping get set back up. It takes a long time to get the infrastructure set back up, especially because of the poor condition it was in to begin with. Before the hurricane season this year, before every hurricane season, as far back as I can remember. And it's due to government corruption. And it's due to mismanagement of, of other industries down there, bureaucracy, the lackluster economy that's going down there, the, the, the millions, the multi-million dollars that Puerto Rico, Puerto, you got to think of Puerto Rico just like any other state in the United States. You know, Illinois is going bankrupt. Puerto Rico is going bankrupt. And it's, it's largely because of the the, the liberal progressive politicians have been in power down there for years. I mean, you see the mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico, that just was hitting and hitting and hitting Donald Trump with these tweets saying, oh, we're dying, we're dying down here. And yet my question is, and this was right after the hurricane, the t-shirt presses must be up and running because she's getting these new t-shirts every day that are bashing Trump. So the t-shirt presses down in Puerto Rico must have been working. Must have been on, online and everything. So I, I'm always skeptical of anything that CNN actually puts out. 
and especially when it comes to Chris, Chris Cuomo, couldn't back it up. And if, if he had the proof, he should have showed it during it. And that was only a minute or some clip. The actual full video is like 10 minutes long, almost 11 minutes long. And I watched the whole thing at no time. Did he give any of the metrics? At no time did he give any actual numbers. And I think FEMA's doing a bang-up job down there. And again, the ports were full. You talk, heard me talk about this last week. The ports were full with containers, you know, reefers and non-reefer containers down there. They just couldn't get them to the stores. Why? Because of the infrastructure. Was that President Trump's fault because of the infrastructure? No. And they were flying a lot of things onto the, the air base down there. The, the Air Reserve Base down in Puerto Rico. That was one of the few ways they could get things in there. Google, they were talking about putting, uh, I don't know if they did or not, they were talking about uh, uh, tethering balloons up with uh, to get people's cell phone servers back up. Uh, but if people don't have power, they can't recharge the phones. And again, there's got to be some better answers to the power grid and the infrastructure down in Puerto Rico. There just has to be. Okay. So I just, it, it just, it's incredulous to me. It, it really, really is. Now, um, let me look down. I, Iowa voter ID law. This came up, um, common sense, indivisible guide. They were both, uh, talking about this. Uh, and let me, I got to find it here real quick. Um, again, I was doing some research right up until the end of the show. So I do apologize for getting in here late on this particular thing. But, you know, going back to the Puerto Rico thing while I'm opening up some of these files here. Um, what needs to be done in Puerto Rico, one, is they, the, the people need to be taught that the government down there is corrupt. And they need, they need to get some very conservative conservative libertarian folks down there that know about economics and know about good governance and they are would do a better job than the crop of folks that are in there okay and it's amazing to me now i had this way back when barney frank was the uh congress was the representative from boston or district in Boston. This man, Barney Frank, uh, still is, as crooked as the day is long. When they bury that man, they're going to have to screw him into the ground. He's that crooked. And yet, and yet, he convinced the people of his district to keep returning back to Washington, D.C. time and time again, no matter how many scandals he was involved in. They still elected him. Ted Kennedy killed a woman way back when. And Massachusetts, time and time again, returned him to office. And the only thing I can say about that is that just shows the character, character and the morality of the people that are voting and putting people like that into office. Hillary Clinton, this last election cycle. I don't know how much proof you needed that she was a pathological liar, that she got people killed, blood was on her hands because of Benghazi, that she was involved for a, a, a pay-to-play deal through the Clinton Foundation, that that's still, the investigation's still ongoing on that, although it's probably page 20 in the New York Times by now, uh, or on the back page nobody reads, or maybe the inside of the back page. Uh, that investigation's still going on the Clinton Foundation, and yet, look how many votes she got across America. Again, it goes to the it goes to the moral character of the people that voted for her. It has to. I'm sorry. It has to. Now, again, I'm not a Trump supporter. Did not vote for Donald Trump. There was a lot of things that he stood for that I didn't agree with, especially when it comes to the economy. And yes, I was disturbed about his locker room talk, but I was also moved a little bit when he actually came out and he interviewed other family members that he apologized for that. He said that was unacceptable behavior. He doesn't do that anymore. And his family, yeah, he doesn't. Friends, no, he doesn't do that anymore. But the anti-freedom folks out there against Trump, they won't let that, oh, he's just a misogynist. Even though he apologized, he's just a misogynist. And yet, 
And yet they, they, they're giving cover to like uh, Harvey Weinstein, Hollywood politicians. And some of these politicians, a lot of these people in America voted for. If you, folks, it, <laughs> you can judge people's moral character in many different ways. And politically, one of those ways is who they support for president, who they support for Congress or Senate, you know, the, the House or the Senate, who they support. So, this came across my desk the other day. Iowa, Iowa's new voter ID law would have disenfranchised my grandmother by uh, Ari Bremen. Uh, this was posted April 13th of this year. I, this is the first I've seen this, and, but, it, but it was brought up the other day on my Facebook news feed, as, and it was just posted, I think it was on uh, Wednesday, I believe it was. Uh, my, uh, it says here at the top of the byline, 260,000 eligible voters would be blocked from the polls by the new law. My grandmother, Sylvia moved from Brooklyn to Iowa when she was 89 years old. It was a culture shock to say the least. When my mom took her, took her to vote, uh, she complained to the can of the candidates. There isn't anybody who's Jewish. <laughs> I thought of my grandmother who passed away in 2005 at 99 when the Iowa legislator passed the stricter voter ID laws today. She didn't have a driver's license because she never drove. She'd frequently walk two miles from her apartment to the grocery store. Her passport expired long ago. She never had a U.S. birth certificate because she was born in Poland and fled the Holocaust. She used her Medicare uh, yeah, her Medicare card as identification. She didn't possess any of the forms of government issued photo identifications that the Iowa will soon require to vote. The ACLU of, of Iowa reported 11% of eligible Iowa voters, 260,000 folks, don't have driver's license or non-operator IDs, according to the U.S. Census and, and the Iowa Department of Transportation and could be disenfranchised by the bill. My grandmother, if she were still alive today, would have been one of them. The problem is with that, and I went the other day and I had it up, a link up this uh, up on the show, the actual bill that he's talking about, the Ar Ari Bream Berman is talking about. There is a provision just like in every other voter ID bill in the United States has been proposed and passed or still in you know the process of being passed that the government, the state government will pay for your voter or your your non-driving id a state photo id so you can vote every last one of them matter of fact when it was adjudicated down in north carolina we talked about this before i talked about this years before on my show that down in north carolina the there they were being sued the state was being sued and the judge rightly asked the plaintiffs in this that were suing the law can you give me an example? Give me some examples of who you're talking about. They found one woman. They, they gave them so many days. It was like maybe 48 hours to 72 hours to come up with some folks. In that time, they only found one elderly black woman that was registered to vote, but didn't have a voter, didn't have a, a photo ID because she never drove. And matter of fact, they took her down and got the ID before they came to court. And the judge threw the case out. And it was like, are you kidding me? And this is what indivisible guy, this is what this what infuriates me about these folks. They lie and they lie again and they lie some more to push their narrative, their agenda in their echo chambers. And this whole article is predicated on a lie. And this is over at the nation.com. Iowa's new voter ID law would have disenfranchised my grandmother. Yeah, you, you lazy thug, if you didn't take her to get her photo ID, which the state would provide, yeah. What kind of grandson are you if you wouldn't take her down to get a photo ID so she could vote? How about that? And I apologize, I don't normally call people names like that, but honestly. These people lie and they lie some more and they continue to lie just to push their agenda and their narrative upon the American people. They do not. George Soros backs these groups. George Soros does not like voter ID, uh, ID laws at all because it would 100% cut 
the fraud. Because you, you have to prove you are who you are to vote. And again, they're still adjudicating those 11 counties out in California, which if, if everything would come out in the wash and they eliminate all those votes that were cast, those overvotes that were cast, they have their, in other words, there's more votes cast than there were uh, voting age citizens in those 11 counties, it would more than take away the votes from Hillary Clinton by a couple million and turn this narrative over about her winning the popular vote also. That, that she, well, she won the popular vote, so she should be president. Well, we don't elect presidents by popular vote. We elect them through the Electoral College. That way, even the small states have a, st have a stake or say in who becomes president. They're, they're always talking about what's fair and what's equal for everybody. You know, that's fair and equal. But it just drives me nuts when these guys continue to put this narrative out and you prove them wrong time and time again. Texas had that voter ID law. And we talked about this on the show, uh, that, that all the disenfranchised minorities. Well, here, the, it was a, a suburb of Houston where they had immigrants down there. We don't know how many are illegal, but they didn't have driver's license. And yet they still, they still said that they were American citizens with no proof. When they went and, and talked to these folks, they didn't ask them if they were illegal or not. They, they just assumed they're citizens. They just didn't have a, a driver's license or state photo, photo ID. And it's all oh, here. They're, they're disenfranchising immigrants. And it's like, but how do you know they're legally here in America? You didn't prove that. And, and again, they lie and lie again and lie some more just to get their agenda going. I just wanted to point that out to you folks. And this is, this is in the show notes page today also. Um, I tackled this earlier in the week here. Celebs, uh, celeb, celebs bash Trump on birth control. Insane female enslavement. And I, and I want you to... I want you to, to zone in on that one part. It's female enslavement. Uh, to get rid of mandates for employers who have a religious um, moral basis not to want to supply people's birth control. And again, we talked about this on the show uh, where birth control isn't that expensive. Um, I, I, I was going to do this the other day and I didn't do it. Um, I'm just going to go to Amazon real quick. And I, I honestly, I've never done, I've never looked this up before on Amazon. I, I'm just, I'm just going to look this up real quick here. And uh, let's see if we can get this in here. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to show this, but I, I, well, you know what? I am going to show this because this is, you know, if you got kids in the room, you don't want them to see this. I'll give you a five count to get them out. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. We have here. I know I'm covering up the first one there, but the second one down there. You can see the second one here. Trojan Super Value Pleasure Pack lubricated condoms. One hundred count. Twenty nine ninety nine. That's thirty cents a piece. For condom, that's male contraceptives. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if it'd be easy to find it. I've tried. I haven't tried it before. I'll try to look that up. I'm just saying, this is the simplest, easiest. Not 100% foolproof, but the simple, easiest birth control you can get, at 30 cents a piece. Okay. I'm just saying, it ain't expensive. It's not expensive. And for these celebs, for these anti-freedom folks out there, these, you know, oh, he's taking away, he's enslaving females over this birth control thing. And this is an article. I love this article. It's by uh, Katie Yoder and Joe and Betty uh, Anderlich over at uh, Newsbusters. I love Newsbusters. It's part of... Uh, um, the MRC, uh, Media Research Center, CN CNS News, those sites. Celebrities are bashing uh, the, the Trump administration for destroying women's basic health care. But at the same time, Hollywood is overlooking what the new birth control uh, decision helps. 
On October 6, the Trump administration rolled back the birth control mandate on Obamacare so that insurers and employers can refuse to include coverage under religious moral grounds. The move was a win for many religious people, especially the little sisters of the poor, an order of nuns whose house and care who house and care for the elderly. They originally faced millions of dollars in impossible fines for refusing to cl- comply with the mandate on religious grounds. Now you're t- <laughs> You're talking about Catholic nuns who take care and house elderly folks and the government was mandating that they need to offer contraceptive. 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 Prophylactics. (laughs) Uh, On their insurance. And that's employee insurance. I don't know if they know about Catholic nuns, but Pretty much, as far as I know, they do not have sexual relations. Part of their vows. Okay, I'm not saying that's 100% absolute, but the vast majority, okay? But Hollywood saw a different decision, or decision def- uh, the decision differently. Actress Olivia Wilde called the decision appalling and likened the Trump administration to a boot on the necks of all women who threaten them. Over a 30 cent condom. We're enslaving the women of the world. For her part, uh, scandal star Kerry Washington brought up gun control. So it's not a good time to talk about gun control, about gun control, but birth control is fine to regulate, she asked. Again, the government's not regulating it. Matter of fact, this is a deregulation. <laughs> It's not a regulation, it's a deregulation. Give me a break, folks. Um, Without birth control and abortion, comedian Chelsea Handler asked, are we supposed to just let men decide? Um, Look, I'm going to use me personally. When me and my wife were first married, we did not want to have kids for the first few years. And I didn't like the idea of my wife going on a hormone as far as birth control pill for her. So guess who was responsible for the birth control? Huh. I was. No big deal. Didn't didn't interfere with our, our sex life at all as a married couple. It just allowed us to have some time together to get to know one another before we introduced kids in the equation. So yeah, we decided together, but it was my responsibility. Chelsea Handler, she has to be one of the most ill-informed Hollywood celebrities I've ever seen. The Twitter account of her Netflix show uh, shared a crude uh, former video contrasting access to Viagra with access to birth control. Uh, We're talking apples and oranges here. Viagra is not birth control. And I, I just... Again, a comedian, Kate uh, Berlant, chanted, forced motherhood is female enslavement. Uh, again. Again. I got to get out of here. Or I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll drive myself crazy. 30 cents. 30 cents a condom. Whether the man buys them or the woman buys them and the woman says, you got to use this. I don't know too many people that can't afford a 30 cent condom. I just can't. I don't know. Now, there might be some extreme poverty cases. Okay. I'm not going to get into other methods of birth control here as as far as, and again, hopefully your kids aren't listening to this. It's called withdrawal. But I'll let you explain. (laughs) I'll let you explain it, but folks. This is so insane. This is such a stupid argument to actually be up in arms about. Oh, now we come to some more stupid stuff by Democrats. And folks, I I have my own opinions about this. The farther left, and there's a new study. We're not going to get into it very much. I only have about four minutes left. New study finds Democrats moving left, dividing growing partisan gap or driving growing partisan gap by Charles Fain. Uh, Lamont, October 11, 2017, over at the Washington Free Beacon. And this only backs up 
uh, Charles Charles's claim here in his in his article, WesternJournalism.com. Randy DeSoto, October 11th, breaking articles of impeachment introduced against Trump. And and, and again, these folks. Represent, and this guy has been in the news a lot about this because he's been, I think, since uh, Congress came back into session after the inauguration or while they're in whatever. Representative Alan Green, Democrat, Texas, introduced, and this isn't the first time, but he's really pushing it this time, articles of impeachment against Donald Trump on Wednesday contending the president does not have to commit a crime in order to be removed from office. The Constitution says for high crimes and or misdemeanors. Nothing, nothing President Trump has done rises to that level. He said, and this, he goes on to say, today I rise to use the constitutionally prescribed political process of impeachment to speak truth to the most powerful man on earth, the President of the United States of America. Green, who represents the district in the Houston area, said in his speech on the House floor, the public has been led to believe that the president must commit a crime to be impeached, which is not true, Green said. If the president uh, persisted with the lie that Hitler was right, he would be and should be impeached, not for a crime, but for per- betraying the trust as a president. If that were the case, if that were the case, then President Obama should have been impeached a long time ago during his presidency. And he goes on to talk about these, the shame and dishonor of the, the officers of the presidency that, that Trump has brought doesn't rise to high crime and misdemeanor. What about all the shame and um, uh, everything like that, that, that uh, and dishonor that President Obama brought to the office of the presidency? Again, <laughs> it, it, it never ends. And this is why. Honestly, folks, I think in 2018, it's going to be a bloodbath for the uh, for uh, Democrats in Congress. I really do. Other stories real quick. We're not going to be able to get into them. Um, Bozell, Hollywood calls for gun control, yet features gun violence 212 times in four of its top movies. And this is by Craig Bannister over at the CNSnews.com. Uh, Trump further dismantles Obamacare overnight, ending illegal cost-sharing payments. Uh, there has been, and it's, it's, I'm doing some research on this, uh, that some of this cost sharing was signed in uh, by an executive order by Barack Obama, and they've come to find out that some of this cost sharing was never taken care of by Obamacare, and it's still a law in the books that it's illegal. And uh, so we're going to do some research. We're going to talk about this some more on Monday. Uh, journalists covering the Russian influence on social media not bothered by U.S. government online psyops. And this is by Danielle Ryan over at Repub- or RussiaToday.com. And then finally, Weinstein Scandal, What It Tells Us About Celebs, Politics, and Hollywood by Russia Today Op Edge. And that was posted yesterday. So, <laughs> folks, I- I- I'm telling you, these, these people, these leftists, these anti-freedom folks out there are going nuts. And honestly, they keep it up. They're going to wa- be walking themselves right out of the door of power and politics. This has been the Dan Clement Show. I'm your host, Dan Clement, your constitutional warrior. Remember, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Have a great rest of the day, and God bless. Remember, on Sunday, attend the Church of God's Choice, not your choice. And we'll see you Monday morning or Monday at noon.